Uh, hello. Uh, I believe we're live now. And uh, I, I'm Mike Seymour. I'm uh, from FX Guide. I'm also a researcher at uh, the University of Sydney. But I guess I'm best known for doing work with uh, FX Guide, uh, which has been a bridge between the uh, sort of tech community and the creative artists in visual effects for some time now. Um, today, we've got a real uh, opportunity to explore some fascinating stuff with uh, Jason Zimmerman. Jason is the supervising producer and VFX supervisor for uh, CBS's uh, Star Trek Discovery, having previously made uh, Star Trek Picard. He's also working within the Star Trek universe in like a whole lot of matters. His team make environments, ships, character effects for some of the most popular and impressive visual effects rendering we've seen in uh, Star Trek universe in many years. In fact, Jason's team, uh, which is a kind of a core CBS hub, does a lot of VFX work as well as working with a suite of vendors producing episodic effects that quite frankly, I think rival uh, feature film uh, level. So uh, Jason, are you there? Yes, I am. Excellent. Uh, so thanks so much for joining us, man. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. So what we thought we'd do, guys, is instead of uh, Jason just giving a uh, talk, we were going to have a discussion. Uh, but before we do that, Jason, I believe you've got a video to kick us off with, with a bit of a highlight reel of some of the uh, tremendous work you and your team have done. I do. Yeah. Let me see if I can share my screen here. One sec. Do that. Here. Don't forget to click okay. that uh, video and audio buttons. Yeah, got them sharing right now. And here we go. I think for me, Jason's just frozen. We'll see if he uh, if he comes back. Hopefully, it's not me that's frozen. Yeah, he's frozen for me as well. We'll wait a moment. Okay. I see we have nearly two hundred uh, participants here, which is absolutely terrific. And I uh, hope you guys uh, have been enjoying this conference as much as I have. I've got to say that we're going to talk to Jason uh, in a minute about obviously Star Trek uh, and um, in a time of COVID, as we think about the pipeline and what the implications were for getting uh, a series, actually, of um, shows, teams together to do uh, Star Trek when COVID hit. But um, interesting and makes my life easier as an interviewer. Yesterday here at the conference, there were some really terrific discussions going on about the cloud, about working uh, pipelines in the cloud, about, uh, gosh, uh, DevOps, for example. And I found so many of the great talks here yesterday just really um, perfect, I guess, a primer for what we're going to be discussing when uh, we get Jason back uh, online. And uh, so hopefully you guys saw those. But if you did see them, and I seem to be stealing uh, from some of the great points that the speakers from ILM and Animal Logic and, uh, and uh, others were, were saying, you'll know uh, I do it with, with nothing but pride. <laughs> Yes. So their discussions were obviously about that pipeline transitioning and what can be possible. But what we're going to talk about with Jason when he gets back is um, how they had to deal with this in a very, very sharp, short uh, turnaround time of what was then, of course, the uh, almost seemed like instantaneous transition that you had to go through with uh, the outbreaks of uh, COVID. And uh, his team certainly... I don't think visually dropped a beat. I mean, obviously, I'm sure behind the scenes, as we'll hear from Jason, it was probably not as effortless as it seemed. But from a visual point of view, the quality of the material that they continued to produce, the way that that worked was uh, just uh, spectacularly good. And of course, that's been reflected in the success of those programs. So Picard, Discovery, um, we've got this entire renaissance rebirth of the Trek universe on television. Now, I'm 
I'm the first to enjoy a good feature film and I have no problem with the uh, brilliant work that's been done by the feature film teams around uh, Trek and the various uh, versions and timelines of that. But wow, to see this kind of quality work on television and uh, in a, a fresh way, not just like a revisiting and a revamping and a re-rolling out, but really um, some fresh visuals, fresh, fresh approaches to problems that have been, uh, been addressed many times. So Tim, you're gonna tell me when uh, you can get Jason back, right? Yep, we're working on it right now. Okay. So one of the things that I, I'm gonna talk about um, with Jason is, uh, well, it's twofold really. Like one of the problems that, that the team has creatively that I've always thought was fascinating. If you come onto a show that's got basically a clean slate, to a certain extent, people always say, oh, it's really hard, right? Like, how do you, you know, do the thing that no one's ever seen before? But I'd actually say that Jason and the team have a, a different creative problem, which is we've seen people solve a number of these type of problems before. They have to come up with a brand new, fresh version that we believe to be in the same artistic or technological, I guess, universe, um, but different. And of course, at a much higher quality level, because the technologies advanced to allow us to do it. It's particularly difficult when you go to something like um, uh discovery or like some of the shows that get closer to the original timeline because there's the biggest gap between the perceived uh, uh or the actual technology that was being made, used to produce those earlier tv shows and the shows that we have uh today and yet you don't want it to look like it's got nothing to do with it and it's completely different similarly if that's happening creatively uh you've got this problem behind the scenes of how to get teams to work remotely and how do you set up pipelines that allow you to do the work that you want to do? And here uh, we'll discuss with Jason in a minute the dual problems of the technology pipeline and the people pipeline. Um, the two aren't uh, unrelated, of course, but they are actually posing slightly different problems. Uh, just because you can technologically do something doesn't mean that um, it's going to work. And similarly, uh, how do you get the people to function as a highly productive team and uh, work remotely? For me, uh, walking on set, which I you know, obviously used to do a lot when I was supervising, uh, I always thought it was a wonderful thing that film productions managed to get a bunch of specialists, that gaffers, um, grips, you know, everybody, hundreds of people together on a film shoot that maybe had never worked together before and have them working and functioning as an effective uh, really high performing team. And so I used to point to the fact that that's why we had call sheets, right? Because nobody knew anyone's name. And from the second that you start, you had to be uh, often productive. But at least there, you could see everybody. <laughs> you could say, well, that's, that's clearly the, the guy in charge of that. And I'm going to go and you know, talk to him because I know what we want. And you get an honest break at just body language and human communication skills. We all right. did what- Sorry to did. interrupt. Uh, yeah. Do you happen to have a contact number for Jason? We're trying to reach him without success on Slack. Uh, I have his email address, which I will uh, uh, ping him on yes, while sir. I talk, just to show you how clever I am. So uh, the thing about uh, um, what's happening with uh, VFX at the moment, when you go into, uh, oh, hang on, I'm just going to have to break my line of thought to look up Jason's email one second. Uh, Tim, you can talk for one second. There you go. The thing we dread most is, is dead air. Thanks for your patience, everybody. I know everyone's very anxious to hear about this talk, as am I, but uh, I'm confident we have enough smart technical minds on our side to solve this problem. Okay. Um, one moment. I've almost done. I've sent an email and I'm just going to pop in the Slack what you want. Okay. I'm back. So, uh, so as I was saying, guys, um, so when you put uh, a VFX crew together, um, you have the advantage, obviously, you're going to be working normally for a 
uh, you know, years together, and then you sort of form up into groups. So quite often, if I'm working in a company, then I form up into the relevant team for that project. Uh, the difference uh, with COVID, and one of the things that I'm keen to explore is that's all well and good to a certain extent if the team's functioning well already. So if I'm already in a team in a company, so we already kind of know each other, we come together for this project, and then you put it um, into a remote learning, a remote uh, uh, working environment, the sort of thing that would happen with COVID. Well, but we all know each other, right? So we have those interpersonal um, understandings, if you like that are the shorthand that mean that we work well as a VFX team. So that's, that's well and good. And so it's hard to, to work uh, all distributed at home, but at least you actually know the people, you kind of know their skill base, you know where they're coming from. And as Jason said to me um, earlier, like, you know, they have an intuitive understanding of the approach that you want to take when you want to solve um, a particular problem. Now, if you do that and you go to COVID and those people have never worked with you before and you have the sort of the double whammy, right? You have the, we've never worked before together and I can't go and see you and kind of suss you out and get you to understand what I'm after and, and where I'm at. And so I, my perception and my hope is that he can eliminate us on this problem that, you know, you've got a team that knows each other, that, um, that uh, gets solved and then you've got a team that doesn't know each other and how do you get them to kind of cohesively work and you'll be glad to know Jason he'll be back with us in about four minutes uh, he has a team working on it at his end there was a problem uh, he's just emailed me I can see it here and uh, he says sorry and he'll be back in about uh, about four minutes so you, you can bear with us for four minutes while I ramble on uh, then uh, then that would be great okay so uh, so you've got this distributed problem of uh, how do you get that team to function really, really well? The other part of my primer for the discussion uh, with Jason is if you go to the cloud and you just basically say, quick, do everything we can to, to get this up and running in a COVID sense, how much is that a, um, an exercise in just getting it to work? And how much is it an exercise where you can get the inherent qualities of the cloud to be taken to their full advantage? In other words, just because I can get something working uh, to mirror what I had in the physical world, and now I've got it on the cloud and in a distributed fashion, does that make it the best that it can be? Are you just putting up with it, it just kind of working? Uh, and so for God's sake, don't touch it. And are, are you doing what you would have done had you been able to do that over a number of years? If you had a number of years to transition to a, uh, a full sort of a remote um, distributed and cloud kind of based solution. Well, then maybe there are advantages in how that happens. Maybe there are uh, technological innovations that can be leveraged uh, that are unique to that uh, new environment, but you're not getting those, right? Because you just sort of ended up there uh, almost by accident. So to give you an example, um, you can spin up a render farm as big as you like, you know, and handle uh, peaks in rendering much easier with a cloud than you can in a physical um, setup. So for those of us that have come through doing uh, project management, it isn't just, can I get all the, the resources to kind of do a critical path that gets me from the front to the end, but I need to uh, sort of load balance that. I can't afford to have at one time, for example, a requirement of sort of 600 times as uh, much render power as I do like three weeks later even if that's the optimum you know, mathematical solution that comes out of a, um, uh, a Gantt chart, what I need to do is have a, you know, a, a good utilization of my resources throughout a long period of time. Spikes kill you and downtime is just a waste of money. The actual opposite is true when we get to the cloud, whereas in fact, it might be incredibly advantageous to run up 600 times as much stuff for just a week. And when you're not using it, you're not paying for it. So why have an even uh, plateau that's suboptimal? And so the problem when you face a thing like going to COVID is as a manager and as a supervisor, uh, as I said at the start, you've got this technological problem, which I just described. You've got this people problem, like how the team comes together and you've got to basically mesh um, a whole lot of dynamics. And <laughs> you suddenly have to be dealing with your client where you can't take advantage of being in the room, reading their body language, you know, um, and so the communication overhead 
you've got those two tracks to worry about the communication ahead uh, above in the production if you like to the creative team to the studio to the director to the producer to the series uh, runner these are all like really really big problems um and there aren't uh, there aren't any more hours in the day uh to get stuff done so so going to a uh an emergency uh, accelerated move to a distributed workplace is just like a really really hard problem that uh, jason and his team had to uh address i know quite a lot about this because um I was lucky enough to talk to him uh, at the end of last year quite extensively about this problem, which of course is one of the reasons that we're doing the, um, uh, the talk today. And uh, one of the techniques that they used um, was the CBS team deployed uh, Teradici for doing basically remote, remote machine working. So one of the things I'm keen to ask you about is the news yesterday that uh, HP has uh, acquired uh, that and whether or not he thinks that's gonna make any difference because there's a lot of these uh, technological parts of the jigsaw puzzle and it's a moving chessboard and uh, you know as most of us know uh, that moving chessboard is quite complex and if Jason was here the other thing that I would go on to discuss is his relationship in that context with the vendors so discovery used vendors such as uh, ghost in uh, Denmark um, uh, Acavision in Germany um, crafty uh, apes which i think was i'm not sure where crafty apes located there was dean egg in london the mill in london um uh pixamondo where uh, jason used to work so he's now got um a pre-existing issue which is just time zones he's got those vendors all providing stuff on uh, both picard and discovery and in that chain of him having to deal with people above him in the chain he also i guess has to deal with the time zones of uh doing those shots and I, uh, I remember talking to uh, Ben Grossman at um, Pixel Mondo where Jason used to work. And he was describing that idea of having a shot being worked on 24 hours during a, a cycle of the rotation of the earth as it moved between their various offices in Pixel Mondo um, so that while he slept, it had gone to two different offices and come back ready for him in the morning. And I think that's a little bit of that that can happen when you have your vendors split between um, Europe and America and uh, London, and if, if London's not part of Europe, uh, <laughs> where you've got uh, teams not only trying to be coordinated, but of course feeding each other um, with uh, assets. And so as much as there's a problem now with the cloud, with just compute power, and of course storage, a big one we heard about yesterday, there's also a problem with uh, asset sharing and being able to make sure that those assets are assets that can be shared between the facilities in a way that really wasn't as critical previously um, as it has been uh, under the COVID conditions that, uh, that Jason and the team um, uh, worked under. Um, and uh, I think I said this earlier, he did have or does have a very tight in-house VFX team uh, at CBS. So he has his own kind of group and then he has um, this sort of, I guess you'd call it uh, hub and spoke model, where he's feeding that work out to these uh, really good companies that are doing you know, great work. And Crafty Apes does great compositing work, something I really admire being an ex-compositor, um, for example. And so uh, you have to be able to make sure that those shots are allocated to those companies, those artists, uh in the right uh in the right setup okay so uh i'm just looking through the wonderful things i was going to talk to uh to jason about um and i guess another one i was looking forward to discussing is his perception of how important it is for the artists which i think is a, is a is almost a universal question now how important it is to the artists that there be a kind of a transparency and a depth of understanding of what's happening in their technology chain. Um, the reason I raise this is it's almost a, an ethical question. Does the artist care where the machine is? Does the artist care? Um, uh, I don't think we're quite there yet, but it's almost to the point like, do we want to get to a point where we don't care how the artist does a naming convention? Um, should it just be an automated process interface between um, something like a shotgun or whatever shotgun's called now? Um, a uh, and um, 
the teams that are producing the packages out of your uh, development teams? Like, can we get that to a point that you, the artist is just sitting down and worrying about their thing and doesn't have to worry about the technology? Or alternatively, is it inherently the responsibility of the artist to um, have a really good understanding of their tools? To use an analogy, uh, like a really good painter would understand a lot about the actual brushes, the actual oils, the actual paints. Um, do they need to understand sort of a lot of that stuff? You know, you can argue that, well, if it looks good on the canvas, that's all that matters. But every good artist that I've ever spoken to, like concept artists and people that used to work in, um, well, actually a lot of digital artists also do uh, manual uh, painting work. When you talk to them about that creative uh, work, that's their own work, it's away from any bosses and away from any um, high tech kind of uh, considerations, management considerations, and they're doing oil on paint, they take a huge interest in the tools and the techniques and stretching of canvases and just everything that they're doing. That's part of the craft. And so the question is, do we require our um, VFX artists to have the same understanding? And as we as we abstract um, the technology. And of course, you know, if you've got a laptop or a computer on your desk, so I should say a computer, a tower on your desk that you've put the bloody card in, that you've, you know, mucked around getting the NVIDIA card to work and the drivers and stuff, you have a very inherent understanding of the tools. Like as we abstract that to, I've just got a, a thin client and it's all happening and I can spin up any combination of GPUs and CPUs in the cloud and, um, the, the software is not needed to be installed by me and not even being maintained by me and additional plugins and everything else are all being managed for me. How much does that impinge upon the artist's uh, realm of responsibility and how much is that something that we think uh, they shouldn't worry about? Can we and should we uh, get that to a point where it's just a, an aesthetic uh, consideration? I think a very important uh, popular question from the Q&A. Do you have time to start your own podcast? <laughs> well, I have had my own podcast. I've actually had, uh, I, I was doing FX Guide TV. We did like 200 episodes of that. I did, and I do, I did uh, and still do do uh, podcasts on, um, on key topics. I guess having done, I think I did in total like 800 podcasts. I kind of got to a point that I was uh, needing to pick my battles. Um, but I've got to say, the thing that I find fascinating is talking to teams and talking to artists. And uh, it certainly helps me with my research and it helps me with everything that I do that we get to, to explore these issues. Because if you get to talk to someone like Jason, who's been through this, um, it's uh, the cheats version of going through it yourself, but you get to do it a, a lot quicker. So that's great. The other thing is, I must admit, um, funny story, there is a company who shall remain nameless. It's not Jason's and it's not one of the ones I named to do with Discovery, who I got banned from talking to because um, I used to get quite in depth in those discussions and people would forget that I were being interviewed. And as a consequence, they just start discussing uh, confidential IP and disclose way more than they meant to. And so the owner of that company just basically banned me on the basis that I tricked people by having them prattle on about uh, technology to a point they forgot that their own NDAs. And, um, and it was just too dangerous for the company to, uh, to have me uh, discuss issues at any depth. But on a kind of a serious note, um, it's incredibly important as a community that we have these discussions like the pipeline conference and obviously digipro generally like i've been at every digipro since it first started and obviously only more recently in pipeline but um the the ability to share is the thing that just makes me love this industry like um it isn't a matter of me saying uh, as an artist normally i've got some clever thing and i'm not gonna tell you what it is and it's not the case that uh artists and tds are saying look at me i'm so clever it's nearly always the case that if you ask a really senior um, TD or supervisor for their advice, that they will happily give it. They'll give you years of uh, experience and insight. Um, we did a story recently um, that's, uh, I believe the next talk coming up um, about uh, uh, deep fakes or rather the use of that in um, Welcome to Chennai. 
And in that, um, in that story, you know, we started discussing in great depth because it's just a heck of a great um, uh, film. It's a great story. It's a really good um, uh, um, technological story, but it, it just turned into a story for FX guide of like, these are like tips and tricks on how to do this brand new uh, technology in a way, you know, it's much superior than uh, like lessons learned, I guess is what I'd say. And so that kind of stuff that, um, that kind of approach, like I totally, Ryan, by the way, is one of the most brilliant um, speakers and artists. So I recommend his talk unreservedly, but Ryan like was just sharing incredibly valuable lessons about what he'd learned in doing that film. And I think Ryan or Jason or people like them, are just super keen to, to share things. Aha, I see Jason is back. Wow, there you are. Hello. Well, that backfired. Rolling blackouts in LA. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Apologies. I'm back. So, Tim, can you tell us how long we've gone? Uh, we have about 15 minutes scheduled to, uh, to complete, um, but we can skip the Q&A portion so we can provide more time for, for questions if you like. We can do a combined one. Why don't you post any great Q&A questions and I'll combine them and right. uh, that'd be great. So let me tell you what I've been talking about, Jason, in the um, half yeah. an hour I've had by myself. I've been running through all the things I was going to ask you about. And so for your benefit, the summary of those things are issues about moving to um, a remote working environment, both in technological terms and in human terms. And uh, technological terms, do you optimize uh, for the best uh, by just jumping in or do you just end up with anything that works? And in the human terms, how do you run uh, teams well? So let's, let's start revisiting those questions. Um, let's start with the technology in no particular order. Um, so my, my question to you is this, if you are moving rapidly to a, a distributed working environment that involves the cloud, is it uh, inherently dangerous that you just end up with whatever you can sticky tape together and that no way uh, maximizes the best you could get out of this new technology? as opposed to if you'd sort of got there slowly because you'd not had a COVID and you'd managed to sort of, you know, work your way towards this with time to, you know, test everything and work everything out to its ultimate best. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you know, COVID certainly rushed the process for us, but at the same time, a lot of the remote working that we needed to do had already been explored by our vendors either for security purposes or because that's how they got the best talent or you know whatever and so part of our process you know certainly was to make sure first and foremost that everybody was safe um, as far as our teams were concerned but then we did reach out to our vendors we had a couple weeks to, to sort of ramp into this so we, we we started by speaking to the vendors who we knew were already sort of using the the, the remote paradigm to ask them what worked for them what didn't work for them uh, to see if we could sort of incorporate that as we were building it. We definitely had to build a runway as we were landing, but at the same time, we, we did have the benefit of having some experienced people around us that we knew could help us sort of inform the process as to what we were going to do. <clears throat> so you don't feel that the solution you ended up with was the sticky tape. You actually got some, so let's use cloud, for example. I was talking about rendering, right? Obviously yeah. you can run up and down renders. That's a product of a cloud environment that's not a product of a physical environment right where you want to have a, an even utilization so those type of things where it's just a different um success is defined differently yeah. you, you sort of got to take advantage of some of those things you didn't just end up with whatever you got for sure i mean we we, we did our best to set it up right because i didn't want to go back and have to you know change something later and also you know and anything you sort of rush in visual effects sort of tends to find a way to rear its head later on and so we, we we knew that going in there was definitely a little bit of duct tape to get it going uh but we wanted to set it up for best practice just because the the way the pandemic was looking we didn't know how long we were going to be in that situation and so the most important thing for us is was to set it up for longevity so it was like there was two there was two you know, paradigms. There was the, what do we do right now to get us up and running? But then what do we do that keeps us going for the long term, not knowing how long we're going to be doing this for? And so we started by making sure all of our in-house artists had access to the, the servers and had access to their boxes so they could work. We'd, we started by making sure our VFX editors could work remotely. Um, and then when we did that, we started to go back and, and then 
look at how could we do something better? What could we do to streamline the process? So we didn't just accept the first answer. We, we, we accepted the first answer in the sense of this is what gets us going. And then we went back and we sort of constantly were like going back and refining and seeing if there was any way we could sort of further the efficiencies of the process. So my second point about people, um, which I think we discussed you and I privately, is this idea that if you've got a working group, like a tight group knows each other really well when you go to a remote working environment well you know it's it's a bummer right but i kind of know you and so we've got this good understanding yeah. it trying to pull a team together that hasn't worked together previously in remote working is super hard because you don't have uh, as somebody mentioned in the q a um, the ability to build normal trust classical trust from those relations at the coffee machine and just you know oh i see a photo of your family there i didn't know you guys went skiing we go skiing that kind of stuff it, all of that goes away yeah. did you or have you had any um kind of window into those two different versions the the tight team now distributed still working well and then somehow trying to pull together the team that hadn't previously known each other sure i mean the the, the good thing about discovery at the time was we kind of had a little of both we had people that had been with us a while that could sort of anchor us and help us to get through the process because they knew it and then we had some new people come aboard that we had to sort of, you know, help them along and, and to learn our process and everything. And, and part of what was nice is that a lot of the people that, that I know that are working with us have been with us for a while. Um, so they knew our systems, they knew I wanted to work. So they were able to train the other people. But, you know, <clears throat> managing the other shows like Picard Now and the, the spinoff and everything, uh, Strange New Worlds, we've sort of taken Discovery as the template, but, you know, we're onboarding new people. And so we have had the opportunity to both do it with people that have been a part of our existing team, as well as people that we are, they are new to us and we're new to them. And so, um, you know, fortunately we have a system and a backbone that works, but the other side of that is that, yeah, I mean, you know, having that, that water cooler talk or that coffee talk where you, you walk into the kitchen and the editor says, Hey, you know, that shot that we do this, that, and you just kind of have that face to face. You don't have that anymore because you're not going to walk into the same kitchen and get the same coffee. So that forces you to have to communicate more. And so I think the thing that we learned was to communicate a lot, if anything, over communicate and do it often, um, not, not just regarding work, but just sometimes to check in with everybody. How are you doing? How's your family doing? Getting to know them, them getting to know us. You know, we, we, we did after work on Fridays, every once in a while, we would do a happy hour that didn't necessarily have to do anything with alcohol, but it was just everybody would sit down and talk about the week and what are your plans for the weekend? I know you're going on vacation. That's great. And it, it it's doable. You just have to sort of force that communication. And, you know, from, from the discovery standpoint and, and to that question, being part of Star Trek, I, I can't tell you how many times I have stood in a coffee, you know, on a coffee break or near a water cooler. And you literally sit there with your hands and do this and say, the ship does this. And then somebody else does that. And, you know, there, there's something about that body language and that physical exchange that helps. And, and you don't really have that with the COVID of it all. And so what that requires is a lot more conversations, you know, a lot more Zooms, a lot more check-ins. Uh, it, it forces you to have to do that. But once you get that system in place and everybody just does their daily check-ins, whether it's with, you know, our VFX editorial to post editorial, or whether it's us to our vendors, uh, it eventually you sort of work out the kinks and figure it out. You just have to be very diligent about it because you don't have the benefit of running into somebody. You have to sort of force those things. So what I'm hearing is that whereas you could have hoped a lot of that stuff would just happen organically, you have to actually go to the trouble as a manager effectively of, of, of facilitating that in a way you wouldn't have had to before. Which brings me to my next point, which is that's sort of with your team or teams, but what about up and down the chain? Like what about uh, your ability to work and just get yourself the nuances of what the vibe is from the creative team or the studio or you know whoever else is and the fact that these are in different time zones quite often. So you've got sort of a couple of extra dimensions there in addition to just the sort of morale thing. For sure. I mean, I, I think, again, it, it all boils down to communication. And, and I think in some respects, sometimes you just have to force it. You have to say, you know, may, maybe, maybe if you're doing reviews at editorial, it may happen more organically because you know that the execs are going to be watching the cut. They may see something. So you can, you'll, you'll hear from the editors or Maybe you'll we'll get a text from one of our writers. Hey, this is a this is a shot we need to work on, or here's a note, or whatever. Um, I, I think part of it was forcing to the to the point about over communication, saying we're going to do three or four reviews a week. We're going to check in with you. We're going to shoot you texts. I mean, it was just constant reaching out, communication, making sure everybody was talking to everybody. And that doesn't necessarily mean I was talking to the editors directly. It might be VFX editorial talking to post editorial, or it might be me reaching out to 
our execs or a writer or whatever, but it was just, it, it really was important for us to, to make sure that everybody was talking and part of the process. And, and, and I think the other side of it is that, you know, in the COVID of it all, I think everybody understood we needed to do that. And so the execs were very flexible. Um, Toronto was very flexible when we were shooting. Everybody was very flexible to sort of listen to, to what we needed and, 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 you know, be available as needed. And I think and that's, that's the main thing is I think everybody needed to make sure they were available. I guess one of the great things that happens uh, with good teams and good people is that if you do get a crisis, people like pull together. So you kind of almost get a better attitude. <laughs> I'm not trying to say anything about anyone, but you know what I mean? Like people really sort of go out of their way to, to help. Hey, um, sure. I don't want to get into any specifics, but uh, there's an interesting question here just about, I'm going to use the word profitability, but I don't want to know the, the actual numbers, but in terms of your budget, was your budget like, destroyed by going remotely was it actually okay like just in terms of i'm going to use the word profitability but i don't know no actual numbers but like sure. how did it affect the bottom line of, of um, um you know not not too much i mean there, there there's obviously the 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 conversation about what happens if an air date pushes or something like that but above and beyond that it was sort of business as usual you know once we got into the swing of things and, and by the way we're we as vfx are only part of the process there's also post there's also sound there's you know, everybody, I think, at the same time was trying to work out their process. Um, but, you know, it was one, once we knew we could we could work the way that we did, it was sort of business as usual. And we could deliver shots the same way we had. We could review, although it was going to be on Zoom and CineSync. Um, we could participate in the color sessions, you know, via, you know, live edit or whatever. And so once the kinks of it worked out, it, it, it really didn't have that much of an implication. It was just sort of that ramping up period where everybody was kind of figuring out their specific discipline and how that fed into the sort of overall, you know, show itself. But um, once we worked it out, it was, it, it, it was very, very smooth, oddly enough. So. This is not a specifically a COVID question, but I said, I was going to ask you this in the, as the sort of warm up. Um, I, I think one of the great challenges that you, your team had as visual effects creatively is an unrecognized dilemma, which is that it's all very well saying, I want to do something no one's ever seen before. Everybody says, yeah, that's hard but you've had time and time again to come up with a new approach to something that I have seen before wants to not look like something I've seen before has to be of the same. I'm going to call it sort of like um, uh, cultural or technological universe. Like it has to not look like it's something un unrelated yeah. and yet it has to look fresh. And so if you could indulge me and the person that asked this question, like how much does that original Canon creatively visually for an effects point of view influence your supervision of new effects new solutions uh, that's a good question i mean we, we we always look at the past to start with and i mean with star trek the beauty of it is you have you know over 60 70 years of content to look at and i think you have to start there um because it's an established show it's an established legacy that helps to inform the future um, so whenever we're doing something, the first thing you do is what did we do before or what did Star Trek do before? What did it do before me? What did it do before Discovery? And you look at all of those things and then you start to ask the questions, what do the tools that are available to us now, what, what do the softwares, what do the technologies afford us that maybe they weren't able to accomplish before because they weren't available? And so I think it's, you know, with, with Star Trek, you have to, you have to give credence to what has come before you. I mean, the supervisors of the visual effects teams have established so much, not just of what the show looks like, but what visual effects now operate like, that you'd be a fool not to take advantage of that. So you, you start with that and then you start to say, okay, what can we do differently or what can we do better based on our updated tools, our updated technologies, our updated understanding of things. So you're, you're constantly referencing the past and then at the same time saying, how can we improve upon that? So it's a little bit of standing on the shoulders of giants and doing your best to you know, to, to, to sort of improve upon what's been done in the past. So spinning back to technology uh, and following up on a, a great question, by the way, guys have been posting terrific questions in the Q and A. Um, how much of your technology stack was, you know, ready to go that you could use uh, remotely to use the term, you know, lift and shift. And was there anything not in your current technology stack that stood out as being, wow, this was great that we had this, this was a great thing we discovered, or this was a great thing that we suddenly got to use? Um, I, I would say everything was, I don't want to say it was plug and play. I mean, there was definitely a learning experience uh, that went into it, but you know, so much of what we do is, 
we award the shots to the vendors, we have calls with them. And, and by the way, that was a huge part of it too, was, you know, as much as we did frequent calls with our team and with our execs, it was frequent calls with the vendors to discuss the process. Um, but, you know- How, did, how did you get day, the color and the time? Like, how did you actually get color fidelity? Like normally I'm insanely fussy on monitors, right? But you yeah. don't know what their environment was. How did you even get those reviews to work? So we, we worked with, uh, you know, the house that did the DI for the show was Bling Chainsaw and they had a live edit solution that was fairly accurate. And so we- we did a bunch of tests and we sat down and made sure that did it look right for everybody. And we kind of compared notes and I would say like, it looks very magenta on my screen. What does it look to everybody else? And just so we, wow, that was, it was that manual. Yeah. Yeah. It was definitely that manual at times. Um, oh. But, but we got through it and we got to a place where we kind of understood, okay, we know what everybody's looking at. We, we kind of understand everybody's saying, seeing the same thing, despite the fact that we had, you know, different monitors all over the place. And, and to that point, the other side of it is, you know, there's certain, you can bring somebody out to, to calibrate the monitors and all that. So you kind of, you, you, you try to bring it into the same universe as much as you can. Um, but uh, we, we definitely, when we started working in Final Color, we had a system that allowed us to see things high res, you know, better than it would be in a quick time or like a, you know, a CineSync or shotgun type session. Um, and then we just sort of, you know, started to give our notes and everything. So it was an organic process. It sort of evolved over time. I, I got to say, like the thing that I find most frustrating is I don't know what you're looking at, right? Like that, I just hate that. It's like, I want to be yeah. in the room so I can do this. And they're like, well, it looks a bit, and you're like, I don't know what you're looking at. Like that I found the hardest thing to get around. It was just- Oh yeah, no. Me. And, and, and especially on our show, I mean, you know, the, the execs, Alex and Michelle and Old Day, they're, they're, they're very particular about their color and, and every part of the post process. I mean, it's not like once it's shot, it's on our, it's in our court. I mean, we're, they're very much yeah. involved. And so, you know, making sure that everybody was seeing the same thing and everybody kind of had the same comments. That was, that was an important part of the process as well as sort of ironing out, like it looks blue on my screen. Well, it looks red on mine. Well then, you know, obviously maybe there's a monitor problem. So that, that was part of what we worked through, yeah. You went to Thin Clients and used uh, Teradici, right? Uh, we did, yeah, we did use Teradici. So all of our artists, we have a small in-house team uh, along with a, you know, a server that sort of serves all of our plates and all that stuff. And we made sure that all of everything that stayed in the office, our artists still had access to, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was curious that they were bought by HP yesterday. Uh, I thought that was really, oh, really yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, in the, I, I was saying- It makes sense. Yeah, I was saying before, a lot of the stuff that you're dealing with, it's like a, um, it's like four dimensional chess. Um, it's like that thing of moving the pieces because there isn't ever a static technological map. There isn't ever a static kind of even creative map um, in yeah. a good sense. Um, so you're kind of managing that. Do you try and lock down your tech a lot or because of that fact, because it's just too many moving parts? I mean, do you sort of say, look, nobody touches this version of, you know, Houdini or Mert Meyer or whatever it is, nobody touches this version or whatever. I'm just trying to work out how, because you've got to swap files between vendors, you've got everyone working remotely. Was there anything you did that say, like, we just got to wind it down a bit on the variables? No, I mean, we, you know, we definitely trust our vendors to know what the technology is and what's best for them and everything. And, and we definitely try to make sure that whatever everybody is using is interchangeable, like you said. So, if vendor A is using something, we want to make sure that if that model needs to travel to vendor B, that it sort of translates over very simply. Um, there are times where there are hiccups or somebody has something in their pipeline which doesn't quite line up, in which case we'll typically have a call and sort of loop in the TDs to make sure everybody is you know, speaking the same language. And if there's a problem, how can we work it out? Um, but by and large, I mean, part of our process is to make sure that the people we work with kind of can work together and so that there aren't going to be any moments where we go well, we we have this discovery and then somebody goes we got to build it from scratch it doesn't work um so that that's definitely something we take into consideration but no i mean by and large we we, we sort of trust the process there and and you know if an update happens to the software fantastic and then if there's a hiccup along the way we all just sort of get on a phone and work it through so my last question is related to those two previous questions, which is um, moving forward. I just want to know how much you feel like the artist needs to be in an environment where the technology is fully abstracted. Because one of the things that you did, like Teraducci and and the other stuff, is like you know you you're no longer saying, "Oh, here's my workstation on my desk, and I know which Nvidia cards in it, and I had to bloody install the drivers like you do when you're a, yeah. a solo." You're at now; it's in the cloud, it's remote. Stuff is happening; things are being run up, and in that pipeline sense, do we 
do you think moving forward, the aim is to get it so the artist really is oblivious to all of those stuff? Or is it the role of the artist to know their tools and as a craftsperson and as a sort of a person effectively in a trade, having a deep understanding of what's going on with those things is just inherently makes for a better artist? Uh, it's a great question. I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, having come from being an artist myself and being a compositor, I think, you know, especially early on in my career, it was important to me to understand the tools I was working with, understand the limitations, other, understand the things, the limits that I could push and not push. Um, so I think it's very important. But at the end of the day, I mean, for me, the artist is the most important thing. And if you have somebody who has a beautiful eye and understands how the show is supposed to look or how a shot is supposed to look or what looks photographic, I think you start from that. So do they need to know the technological things? Not necessarily, but that being said, you need somebody very close who does know those things and can inform that stuff because they go hand in hand and visual effects is such a, such a crossroads when it comes to technology and creativity. I, I don't think you can separate the two. Do the artists need to know it? No, but they need to have access to somebody that does. And we need that in our world at all times because there's, there's no question that the the backbone and the pipeline of what like what, what we've done with, with discovery you know in in the in the pandemic was not going to be possible without the technical first and then the artistry and they go hand in hand you, you can't have one without the other in that case if 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 you don't if you don't have the backbone to support the artists you're done but there's the nothing time, more yeah. detrimental to the artistic process than the frustration of tech not working <laughs> Yeah, you know, if you want to blow up a creative, give them stuff that doesn't work properly. And hundred percent, waking, waking up in the morning to an email from an artist that says I can't access my box because Teradici is down because of an internet issue, is the worst email I could possibly receive. You know, and so I think making sure that you have a rock solid foundation for them to work from is important. Even better though is the artist that says, "Hey, you know, Teradici was down, but I figured out a way around it, or I fixed it, or I restarted the box." And so I think having both of those things is important. Or we had a rolling blackout and we managed to come back from it with a smile on your face without oh, uh, <laughs> cussing or or complaining. Uh, we've well, run out of time. It but... to me. It's never happened in the entire history of the, the pandemic thus far, but I guess there's a there's a first for everything. No, so, yeah. Jason, you're you're uh, you're brilliant, man. Thanks so much for for bearing with us. And I'd like to thank the 200 people that stayed with us even though they only had me not you for, yes for thank the, you uh, i, I apologize game. so much guys i did my best so i apologize for the time we lost no 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 i i don't mean that i just mean i think it's uh it's just such a um almost metaphysical uh meta uh version of what we went through with the pandemic to have exactly a kind of yeah. this incident happen during the call of I, guess, I guess it's only appropriate <laughs> i think you're right yeah <laughs> okay great talking to you man thanks so much all right guys thanks so much see you guys bye